this is the first in the series of our virtual rural business briefings, which are taking place over the next few months as we head into autumn. The programme has really been formulated to be aimed at forward thinking owners, managers of estates, farms and, and other rural businesses um, and the rural community with presentations on sort of pressing issues and hopefully the latest updates to, to keep you all informed. Future topics um, will relate to alternative land uses, agribusiness, land ownership, succession, and multi-generational farming. And further de details and invites for these sessions will be received by you shortly. So today we kick off with our session on agri-tourism. Um, it goes without saying that tourism plays a, a vital role in the wider Scottish economy and indeed the rural economy um, with visitors from both home and abroad coming to take part in sporting activities to see historical monuments and sites and indeed just to, to enjoy our fantastic scenery. All of this has of course been very significantly impacted by the current circumstances with the coronavirus pandemic and with a view to the, that backdrop I'm delighted um, to welcome our guest speaker who's been able to join us today, Riddle Graham, who is Director of Industry and Destination Development at Visit Scotland. Riddle's been involved in tourism in Scotland since 1978 and is absolutely ideally placed to share his insight into the current market conditions and what he expects to see in the future. So we're delighted and very pleased that he's taken the time to join us this afternoon. After we've heard from Riddle, we'll hear from one of our commercial partners, Grant Campbell, who will consider the contractual aspects and the key terms and conditions to focus on in the tourism sector. And then we'll hear from Kate Donaghy from our health and safety team, who look at the measures that need to be considered in the current climate, obviously health and safety being of very great significance. It's sure to be an interesting event and I hope you enjoy it. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Riddle. Thank you. Alex, many thanks indeed. And thank you for inviting me to participate this afternoon. I'm delighted to be involved. Um, what I thought I would do is a very quick overview of the importance of tourism to Scotland and particularly to the rural economy. Talk a wee bit about the impact of um, the virus um, and the work that I've been involved with through the Scottish Tourism Emergency Response Group. and then talk specifically about uh, agritourism and the work we've been doing with uh, Go Rural and the agritourism people. So, um, quick run through. Um, for those not aware, and I'm sure you are, but just some figures, um, 16 million overnight visitors a year to Scotland, spending five billion pounds, so hugely important. But on top of that, 153 million day trips, and again, a spend in, in excess of five billion. 20,000 businesses involved, nearly 220,000 jobs at stake. Um, <clears throat> and I think the important message that we get across to the government all the time is it touches every part of, of the country. In terms of agri-tourism, um, the indications are with 16,000 registered farms in Scotland, um, there's between 800 and 1,000 involved in agri-tourism. That's an estimate made by the agri-tourism people that are working on this. Um, and there's measurement activity going on at the moment to try and put uh, a much clearer uh, figure on that in terms of their economic impact. I think what's been really encouraging with the work we've been doing with uh, Caroline Miller and the team uh, in Go Rural is that they're wanting to focus in on quality assurance and genuine farmers. And they've set out a, a series of recommendations in terms of what agritourism really means and covers. There's been a lot of work over the years um, to, to try and identify that and we're working closely with them. In terms of the impact of, of COVID, again, no surprise and just kind of to run through devastating impact, all businesses closed. Um, the estimate that we've put in from the middle of March to the end of July is around 40% of lost revenue across the whole of the Scottish economy, which in tourism terms equates to a loss of about two billion pounds. So a huge impact. And since the reopening in July, 
quite a mixed report, self-catering and caravan and camping in particular uh, recording positive results. Hotels, bed and breakfast, a wee bit more variable. Certainly in the cities, uh, very poor um, results, certainly in, in Edinburgh and Glasgow with the rural parts of Scotland doing better. And one uh, shining light in terms of success, the Eat Out to Help Out scheme has been unbelievably successful for those businesses involved in uh, eating and drinking. Um, the issues that are driving that, again, no surprise, reduction in international visitors, next to none around, um, no events happening, no business tourism, but a very strong staycation domestic effect uh, with rural areas benefiting from that significantly. Um, and one negative which has been widely publicised in the, in the national press, a whole piece around irresponsible camping, and the caravan impacts in certain parts, particularly in the island communities, uh, which has been really unwelcome. The government response has been pretty massive, um, wide range of business support initiatives from both the UK and Scottish governments. I was doing a quick count the other night, 20 different schemes with funds and initiatives and encouragingly ongoing support and engagement. We're managing the self-catering fund at the moment and the events fund. Um, on, on behalf of Scottish Government. I wanted to say a wee bit about the Scottish Tourism Emergency Response Group. Um, this was founded a way back in 2001 um, when we had foot and mouth disease and I, I well remember uh, as I was working in the borders at the time um, the impact that that had particularly right across the south of Scotland. So the core group that exists there is Scottish Government, Scottish Tourism Alliance representing the industry, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Scottish Enterprise, South of Scotland Enterprise, Convention of Local Authorities and Skills Development Scotland. And I chair the group we've been meeting uh, weekly since the middle of March. And the main focus has been around uh, our action plan, which is publicised if you've not seen it on our uh, corporate website, visitscotland.org. And the four main themes which are consistent in terms of our approach, respond, reset, restart and recover. Um, in the respond phase, pretty much intelligence and data gathering, listening to the industry, opening a dialogue between industry and government and trying to make sure that we had immediate support in place. Resetting in terms of finding out what other people were doing throughout the world uh, and some of our initial consumer facing communications, reminding people that Scotland still existed, even although we were in lockdown and encouraging people to start preparing for reopening. The restart phase heavily involved in developing the guidance for Scottish tourism uh, businesses uh, right across the piece, notably in the rural economy for safe reopening. And, and one highlight there, of course, our good to go scheme, working with our other partners in Visit Wales, Visit England and Northern Ireland. And then the recovery phase, which is now uh, in the process of kicking off with a new Tourism Recovery Task Force being chaired by uh, Fergus Ewing, our Tourism Minister. Key highlights, I think, of, of the work, um, huge engagement with a wide range of businesses and tourism organisations, very impressive lobbying by Scottish Tourism Alliance, and in the case of Agritourism by Caroline Miller um, and the Go Rural Initiative, a uh, fantastic piece of work there. Um, excellent funding support packages, but again, not everyone benefited. Good collaboration be between the key agencies. And on the Good to Go scheme, uh, six and a half thousand businesses signed up, which I think is a testament to the desire of businesses to do the right thing and engage properly. And on our marketing front, um, some very uh, detailed marketing campaigns, particularly focused at, in the first instance on day visits and then on Scotland, which seems to have generated uh, good business for the country. On the task force, which is still ongoing, a group of in excess of 30 key uh, uh, individuals there, um, looking at stimulating demand, asking for extension of the VAT reduction, um, increased marketing. On business recovery, uh, around looking to extend the furlough scheme, looking for low cost loans, longer term financial support to get us right through until when all this uh, pandemic finishes. And then one particular one, business rates, holiday extension, but a whole programme of requests there from 
um, from that group. And then finally, on the investment side, two of particular note um, in the rural economy, uh, the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund, uh, looking for an extension of that. We currently have a, a budget of three million there, and the current ask in, the, in, in this year is in excess of 12 million. So we're looking for more money there. And a, a strong focus on green uh, and responsible tourism. Um, throughout the um, pandemic, the agri-tourism activity has been most impressive indeed, as I indicated earlier on. Um, initially, a virtual support group set up um, by, by Caroling with a good turnout and a, a webinar program that has been well supported um, since the beginning of April. The Lambathon, which um, I've got the figures for, really impressive and, and touched a lot of people, which was then followed by the Farm Facebook Live events. And I suspect maybe some of the people on this call uh, were involved in that. Great to see the resurrection of Go Rural in two different uh, forms um, and recognition um, by government of this subsector as being important and strong links with the Association of Self Caterers. Um, the Agri Tourism Monitor Farms. Um, massive increase in engagement and communications around agritourism, both in consumer and corporate publications. Involvement with the Food and Drink Tourism Group, Scotland's Food and Drink Fortnight, well underway now. Um, and I think what's encouraging from our point of view, impressive monitoring and evaluation and results. Um, and Caroline Miller has identified the need for even more um, uh, clarity in terms of the economic benefit that this particular sector brings in terms of money and, and jobs. I mentioned um, the, the cow with the four coloured wellingtons on the, on the foot, Go Rural and Scottish Agritourism. Go Rural being businesses to the consumer and Scottish Agritourism the, the business to business. A few figures just to share with you in terms of the results. Um, 10,000 families or individuals watched the Welcome to My Farm and Lambathon live videos at home. Two and a half million people saw one of the posts, including live tour or trailers or photos. And just under 200,000 individuals reacted to live videos through comments and shares. So the team reckoned that almost 750,000 minutes of live video re re reviewed by individuals. These results are truly astonishing and can just go to show what can be achieved uh, even at a time when we're not actually meeting face to face. Um, the results I have um, for all that activity, uh, impressive 77 different farms across Scotland took part in Lambathon and Welcome to My Farm. Total of 124 farmers took part. Um, and um, the results in terms of the posts have been really quite incredible. We've been working very closely with um, the agritourism people um, and we're looking forward to some of the work that we can do to support the sector even further in relation to digital skills, in relation to quality and the importance of uh, investing in the quality of the tourism product to, act, uh, to attract both the domestic and international visitor looking at how we can help business growth and how, and very importantly, how we can create inspiring content that can be shared both on our main website, but also on individual uh, establishment websites. And I've got to say, I've been hugely impressed with the innovation and creativity coming from, from that group in terms of diversification and using uh, digital technology to, to present a message. So, the, the next areas that we'll be working on, we, we have a, a member of my staff seconded into supporting the agritourism industry and developing the Go Rural brand. We're sharing content on our main website. We're continuing to support social media activities and PR activities. And very importantly, we've got our insights team working on measurement and evaluation, um, trying to ensure that uh, the sector continues uh, to thrive and grow. I suppose uh, in conclusion, uh, I would say that <clears throat> um, there is obviously ongoing concern about the impacts of the pandemic, um, the increased numbers, particularly uh, south of the border, give us grave concern. Um, we are ready to go on a major uh, marketing campaign, but clearly Scottish Government health advises that we need to hold back on that until it's safe to do so. 
um, but we're ready to go. The international market, we believe, will not be returning until um, early next year at the very earliest. And so much depends on how the, the, um, the pandemic uh, bears out in, in other parts of the world. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be involved. Um, I mean, I've known Caroline Miller and, and her work for a long, long time, and I'm very impressed with the work that's been carried on through um, the, the virus. Uh, and we recognize this sector as being important. We recognize it as being important because of the innovation and creativity of the people involved, but also about the huge potential it has. And those people that are doing it well um, are uh, enjoying some really good results. I'm, I'm hearing of, particularly in self-catering, um, uh, bookings right through until the end of this year and, and well into next year, which is very encouraging indeed. So I'll stop there and delighted to answer questions towards the end of the presentation. Thank you, Alex. Hello everyone, sorry for the delay. Uh, Grant Campbell here, thank you Riddle. Um, I'm a commercial partner, so I, I deal in commercial contracts. Um, I've been asked to, to talk a little bit about um, key terms and conditions for the tourism industry, and clearly as Riddle's just mentioned, uh, we're definitely not out of the woods in terms of the pandemic. So um, issues about what's in your contracts uh, are still incredibly important. So the outline for the talk, move the slide, please. Yeah, so I want to talk, I've, I've made, I thought it would be most useful if I talked about contracting with consumers, because actually that is um, the most tricky aspect of contracting, because consumers have certain enhanced rights, and I want to talk a little bit about those. So what I'm going to speak to are guidance issued by regulators, the Contracts and Markets Authority, uh, talk a bit about consumer law because that is the backdrop against which you can prepare your contracts. Refunds and alternative options is a big topic, clearly, given what's happened with the pandemic. Uh, future bookings, particularly given the news that we've had down south about the, you know, the figures on, on the instances of, of the virus, you know, we're not necessarily out of the woods yet, so what should you be thinking about in terms of future bookings? Riddle's already talked a little bit about there, so I'm not going to say terribly much more, but there are some useful links, uh, Riddle mentioned, uh, where you could find out information about its work, but they're on the slides. And then I actually want to talk a little bit about consumers actually contracting the virus, either just before they make it, they, they're due to arrive or when they're actually on premises and what you can do about that contractually. So if we move on, please. So I think when, it, when thinking about consumers, it is important um, to recognise, firstly, that um, this is an area in which regulators are particularly interested. Um, so the Competition and Markets Authority identified holiday accommodation businesses as an area of concern early on in the pandemic, and there was quite a lot of publicity, including on the BBC website, uh, in terms of businesses, and I think it was Whole Seasons was one of them, who were under scrutiny and attracting a lot of criticism because of their stance initially uh, when the pandemic hit in terms of refunds, et cetera. So this is an area where actually reputation and publicity is, is quite a big factor. Um, the CMA has issued guidance on cancellation and refunds. I've set out the link where you can find it. It is definitely worth reading. It's worth reading, it goes beyond the black letter law. I'm gonna talk a little bit about consumer protection law in a second. So the CMA guidance goes beyond that, but I suspect most businesses will want to be operating within the guidance that the CMA has issued, because if they don't, people are gonna be reciting it at, at them. So I think looking at that CMA guidance and understanding what it says will be particularly important. Next slide, please. The black letter law uh, on consumer rights is found in the Consumer Rights Act 2015 and also in the Consumer Protection Unfair Trading Regulations. So, th so that's where the law can be found. In essence, however, 
Um, what the what the law requires is that terms and conditions for providing goods and services to consumers must be fair. Uh, they must not create an imbalance between the parties. And what does that mean? It means that they shouldn't be um, they shouldn't be one sided. So um, in the legislation, there are a list of specific provisions which are deemed as being unfair. And if they're unfair, the terms are not binding on the consumers and can't be relied on by businesses. Most, one of the most obvious ones is excluding statutory rights. So if um, you, in your provision, your terms and conditions, you exclude statutory rights, then that's likely to be something that would be deemed to be unfair and not binding upon consumers. But beyond just fairness and um, balance, the other thing that I think is important to remember is that they also need to be transparent. So if you're relying on terms and conditions with consumers, it is important they're transparent. And transparent just doesn't mean that people have seen them. They need to be plain and intelligible. So they need to be in plain English. They need to be intelligible so that actually consumers can actually uh, understand the rights that they have. There's much more general guidance um, in these, the link that is at the bottom of the, the slide, which sets out in great detail the CMA's approach to when terms and conditions will be considered to be fair and reasonable. And again, if you're looking at your terms and conditions, I think it's important to ensure that they actually, none of the provisions in there go against what's in the guidance. So worth looking at. In terms of remedies, again, I think this was controversial early on in the pandemic, but I think we've seen the settling down of this and the recognition of what's required. So again, when dealing with consumers, if a business cannot perform the services booked, a refund should be offered to the consumer, and this includes deposits. And simply providing that a deposit is non-returnable is not likely to work in a consumer context if no services are being provided. However, what the CMA have said is that if there are costs that you have been you have incurred, it may be permissible to retain some of those costs from a cancelled booking, but you again have to be very transparent about what those costs are and how they would be calculated. Partial refunds uh, may be appropriate where some services have already been provided. So the normal part fund, some services have already been provided and that may be appropriate. On vouchers, and again, early on in the pandemic, people were being offer, offered vouchers and corralled, I think, by some, towards taking them for a postponement to a, a booking next year. CMA's view is these can be offered, however, they must not be communicated to the consumer as the only option because a refund is something that should be offered as well. Next slide, please. Future bookings, and again, I think this is, this is important given where we are. Uh, don't seek payment for any services you know that you will not be unable to provide. So if you are providing a service that you think you definitely will not be able to provide, then you should not be seeking payment for it. At, at the moment, I would imagine that's unlikely to be happening, but again, we move into a situation where the easing of the lockdown is reversed, something that will need to be borne in mind. Um, many businesses, and I think again, one eye on commercial advantage, but also on some of the issues that have risen with adverse publicity, have been adopting a no quibble refunds policy for bookings that are placed on or arrivals from certain dates without any issues around COVID. And again, that, but that, that's something they're doing, I think, as a matter of commerciality rather than as a result of any legal requirement to do so. Other thing I would say just about future bookings and, I, and more generally about future proofing contracts, you may look to put a variation clause into your contract that allows you to change your terms on notice. In a consumer context, you have to be careful with those. They're not banned, so you can still do them, but they have to be tightly drawn. They have to give notice to the consumer about the changes that are being made to the contract, and you shouldn't 
uh, seek to change a contract in a way, using a variation clause in a way that is likely uh, to leave the consumer worse off. So keep it tight. Uh, if you make a change, you have to positively communicate it to those you've contracted with. And you need to make sure that consumers are not worse off, or if they are going to be worse off, that they can get an effective remedy, which again is likely to be a full refund of the price they've paid for the service. Next slide, please. Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, I have a slide here on the work of Sterg. I'm not going to go through it, but what, what you have there is you have the link that Riddle mentioned to the Visit Scotland website concerning the action plan and also links to the government's guidance uh, issued for tourism and hospitality. And I know that Kate Donaghy, who's going to speak next, will cover that in a little bit more detail. So I think I can swiftly move on. So what terms can you include in your contracts with consumers? Well, I think there are a number of things. Um, firstly, you can require consumers to adhere to the government guidance, when it, particularly when it comes to the limitation of numbers and numbers of households and accommodation that you may be offering. And it, I think it's worth mentioning just in the context of government guidance, government guidance doesn't necessarily always have legal effect. So contractually, uh, the impact of government guidance can be uncertain. So one thing you may want to think about in your terms and conditions is actually specifically referencing government guidance and saying that um, perhaps that the services that you offer will be offered only where it is possible to provide them in terms of government guidance. So you're then giving them some form of contractual effect that can work in, the, in your contract. Um, you can require consumers to wear face coverings, again, where required in accordance with government guidance. Um, you can require them to provide the relevant contact information to the Test and Protect service. Next slide, please. You can require them to follow hygiene requirements during their booking, so you can uh, require them contractually to use things like hand sanitizer, removing personal items at the end of the day, stripping and bagging linen. Uh, you can require them to adhere to set timings and understanding that there will be no options to extend. Uh, in appropriate cases, you, social distancing measures, whether that is one-way systems or additional instructions uh, that are required for social distancing purposes. And you can uh, also require them to adhere to any use of facilities depending on what those are in terms of um, facilities for one in, one out, whatever it is. But what I would suggest that you do want to have in your terms and conditions is strong cancellation rights. So allowing businesses to cancel future bookings if these can't go ahead, because for example, you have a current guest who's in situ has contracted COVID-19 uh, or that um, because of updated government, government guidance, which will restrict preventable capacity. And I imagine that the guidance that's coming into effect in England may well have an impact on restrictions in terms of both households and numbers who can be in uh, uh, accommodation as a result. But again, this will be subject to what I've said earlier in terms of the rules or refunds. So final slide, please. Yes, yeah, so what happens if you're a consumer that you've contracted with contracts the virus? Well, I think um, in terms of consumers who are coming to a property, I think you can contractually uh, include provisions that say they should not come if they are displaying any symptoms of the virus or suspect they have contracted it. Uh, for, for guests who contract the virus during their booking, I think you can require the guest to notify you immediately that this has happened. And again, I think you can require them to follow particular procedures to ensure that the risk to others are, is mitigated as much as possible. And that may include requiring them to return home where that is reasonable, and that would be by public transport. Um, where, however, it's not possible for a guest to travel um, having contracted COVID, then I think it is permissible to say in your terms and conditions 
the guests will be expected to pay the cost of an extended stay. Uh, and the CMA in its guidance has said that actually they think that is fair and reasonable, although there may be circumstances in which it wasn't. And the, the example they give, and I would hope would be exceptional, is where actually the condition of the property was such that it is actually contributed to the consumer actually contracting the virus. So I think there's, there's, there's plenty to say in terms of terms and conditions. I think because we're not out of the woods yet when it comes to the pandemic, businesses should continue to look at their terms and conditions. And I think maintaining flexibility to offer a service that actually um, will be, that allows for it to be constrained but or constrained by what is in the government guidance as it changes from time to time will be important. But ultimately, you can't leave consumers in a worse position than they would be. So you have to be very careful. Okay, I think that is me. So having uh, finished, I will hand over to Kate. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Grant. And I think it's right to say there is some necessary overlap between the points Grant's covered in relation to terms and conditions and those that I'll look at in relation to health and safety, because of course, the new terms and conditions are focused on ensuring compliance on both sides with government guidance and then dealing with the consequences of that. So today I'm going to look at the health and safety guidance for self-catering accommodation and the providers of that service. Um, and the outline for that, I'm going to look at um, the formal Scottish Government guidance, um, a risk-based approach, the importance of communication, enforcement, industry guidance, and then um, to go back to where Grant finished, what happens when someone gets ill when they're staying in your property? So what are the rules for self-catering accommodation? And the bad news, I suppose, is that there isn't an easy answer to that. There's very little by way of detailed mandatory requirement for this sector. The good news though, is that this reflects a recognition that not all businesses are the same and that different things will be right for different operations. There's also what's termed industry guidance, which isn't binding, but which does offer helpful resources for businesses who are trying to navigate this new way of working. The formal government guidance, which relates to self-catering accommodation, also applies to visitor attractions, marine and adventure tourism, tour operators, pubs and restaurants, retail aspects of tourism, natural spaces, fun fairs and amusement parks, and so on. It's a wide range of businesses with a diversity of customer contact and requirements. And unsurprisingly then, as I noted, there is not one size to fit all. And the, the comment again, um, and um, echo what's been said by Grant and Riddle, all of this guidance, informal and informal, is subject to change. We need to be prepared for things to adapt to what continues to be an unpredictable and evolving, situ an evolving situation. And unfortunately, what that means is more work and frequent reviews of any systems which are put in place. So what should accommodation providers do? And the government recommends that a risk-based approach is taken. And the starting point for that is a specific COVID-19 risk assessment. In practice, that means taking a step back and looking at all of the activities associated with your business. What are the risks of transmission created by the operation of your business? Who's at risk? What can be done to protect them? And who's going to do that? It's also important to remember here that there's been no reduction or dilution of pre-existing health and safety requirements. And so in the simplest sense, it wouldn't be acceptable to implement measures to prevent transmission of COVID-19 if those measures put the health and safety of staff and members of the public at risk. In addition, if the impact of COVID-19 on the operation means that pre-existing safe systems can't be maintained, then it might well be that the business can't trade or that substantial changes to the way it operates are required. And what that means, unfortunately, again, is that all risk assessments and method statements which pre-exist um, COVID-19 should be considered alongside the new ones 
to ensure that your pre-existing safe systems of work can be maintained. Things like reduced staffing because of illness or an inability to double man tasks because of the need for social distancing are likely to be relevant to those um, considerations. Of course, the core purpose of COVID-19 restrictions really is to reduce the transmission of the virus to the lowest level possible. And broadly, businesses must achieve this by ensuring a distance of two metres is maintained between people not from the same household, keeping numbers inside and outside at a level which allows this to be achieved and maintaining cleanliness to prevent transmission via um, contaminated surfaces. Now, I, I think again, it's fair to say that the requirements um, imposed by the government do not invite a half-hearted or lip service approach. The government guidance states that businesses should do all that they can to change the way they work and that premises are used in order to ensure compliance with the rules. It's noted in several places that no workplace or public place should feel the same as it did before. And the HSE, as I mentioned, are not loosening um, any pre-existing requirements on businesses. So another major challenge for business owners and employers at this time is generating confidence in employees and customers that the operation is in fact safe and following guidelines. So we can move slide. Staff need to believe that it's safe to return to work and really that they'll be looked after when they are there. And staff should be consulted during the risk assessment process and should be fully aware of its terms when it's finished. There should be good training um, and instructions for staff so that they know what's required of them. And then you're going to need uh, strong supervision after that to make sure that the systems you've devised are actually being followed in practice. Now, it's important to have an ongoing dialogue or communication with staff to explain what's been done, but also to listen and respond to their concerns and allay any fears they might have. Now, while communication is key for any business, for holiday accommodation providers, the views of the local community might be particularly important. There may be anxiety and suspicion about people coming in from other areas and the risk that their presence and behaviour might increase infection rates. And this could be allayed to some extent if you're able to demonstrate to society the care that you're taking and offering contact details for any concerns might be helpful for that. In our current circumstances, demonstrating that you're exercising care is likely to be just as important to ensuring well-being and continuation of business as doing it is in the first place. So communication is going to be really important as uh, businesses adapt their practices going forward. So uh, moving on to the teeth of the system, which is obviously enforcement. Now, Police Scotland and local authorities have powers to enforce COVID-19 restrictions on businesses. And where there's a direct risk to public health, a prohibition notice could be served. And this would prevent you from operating at all until the breach was rectified. Now, I think it seems likely at the moment that these powers will be beefed up in the coming weeks. We've already seen Police Scotland be given more powers in relation to breaking up house parties. And it's clear that the Scottish Government does want to crack down on the risky behaviours that are driving up the infection rates at the moment. Last night, a new limit on social gatherings in England was announced and significantly was backed up by police powers of enforcement. And so this really makes careful consideration of the risks posed by your business and the introduction of robust controls to reduce that risk all the more important. Now, although there's no formal or mandatory guidance for the detail of the measures to be taken, as I mentioned, there is some industry guidance available, which isn't binding, but which offers some useful detail um, for business owners who are trying to work out what they should be doing. And for self-catering accommodation, there's some really useful um, resource from the Association of Scotland's Self-Caterers. And this has been developed with the Professional Association of Self-Caterers and the Wales Tourism Alliance, and it's supported by the Tourism Alliance, the Scottish Tourism Alliance and the Wales Association of Self-Catering Operators. Now, this provides guidelines for cleaning, along with a model cleaning checklist and FAQs, which are updated on an ongoing basis. As I mentioned, it is just guidance and it's up to owners and operators to choose what they want to implement for each scenario in their own business. 
Now, cleaning um, is a burning issue for accommodation providers at the moment and working out how much is enough and what's appropriate. So one thing that the industry guidance here recommends is a checklist for staff. And I think it would make sense, despite the work which would be involved in this, to draft one for each property or each type of property which um, is used so that cleaners know they have to do everything on the list and there's no ambiguity about what is or isn't applicable. But it means that the staff do know exactly what they're doing and there's a way of checking um, that it's been done um, and there's no room for wriggling out um, of knowledge there. Now, the guidance recommends throughout a robust two-stage cleaning process which involves cleaning and then disinfecting. Um, rather than just spraying disinfectant everywhere, which I think um, wouldn't be helpful at all. But in essence, what's required is all hard surfaces, including skirting boards, are treated to that two-stage process. Um, and that includes communal areas and also garden and outside areas. So things like garden furniture, play equipment in gardens. There's guidance around bed linen. Um, it's to be washed at 60 degrees um, or left for 72 hours, but obviously still washed. Um, in relation to soft furnishings, those are more difficult and the suggestion is they should be steam cleaned or fogged, which I'll come back to. Um, and there's a recommendation here that the products used are certified to EN 14476, which is an antiviral, has antiviral um, properties rather than just antibacterial ones. So it could be that choosing um, the chemicals which are used is important here. Now, in relation to fogging, this involves spraying disinfectant in an aerosol um, around premises and it can only be effective if the surfaces have already been cleaned first. The WHO guidance seems um, now to be suggesting that actually in some circumstances it can do more harm than good um, and I think that's really where people are just spraying it into the air. I think it's still probably a good option for soft furnishings um, but I think that's something that needs to be um, kept under review. Now, something that needs to be um, mentioned here is the position where you're using a third party provider um, for anything but cleaning in particular. In terms of a business's own obligations, it would be prudent to require confirmation of what's going to be done in each property and how and of the systems which are in place to ensure that this is achieved every time. Um, if anything happens or if any investigation is carried out into your business, it's unlikely to be enough to simply say someone else is dealing with that aspect and have done no more. Indeed, where you're using any third party providers, you should be asking to see their COVID-19 risk assessments and method statements um, and satisfying yourself that their proposed work and way of work is compliant. Now, just generally moving on to touch on some of the more um, overarching things that can be done um, to ensure um, that the risk of transmission is reduced as far as possible, things like contactless handovers, but even there it's recognised that where the personal touch is a key element of a service offering um, and, and so a, per, a personal handover is needed, things should be done to reduce the risk of transmission so that this takes place outside um, and with the, the host not going into the property or touching anything in there. Um, during the stay, limit visits to the property should be limited um, to those for essential maintenance. But again, if regular cleaning is going to be a key part of the service, then it may be that there's ways around that, but it, it needs to be taken carefully. Now, there are things you can ask the guests to do during their stay um, to reduce the risk of transmission in the property, and that would include keeping it ventilated and at the end of their stay to get them to take all their personal belongings away um, to bag up their waste and to strip and bag up their bed linen. Now, I know one thing that comes up is whether it's necessary to have a gap in between bookings to allow the property to be empty for a few days. And the guidance here is that no, that isn't necessary so long as the cleaning is sufficiently robust. And what about pools and hot tubs and spas? Well, the good news there is that there seems to be no evidence that the water can transmit the virus, so that's fine. But the difficulty creeps in um, in getting in and out of these um, water activities, getting changed and using toilet facilities when you're doing that. And so the advice is that if 
that kind of facility is shared between properties, a rota system might make sense with cleaning um, in between each property uh, using the facilities. But again, you're back to finding something that works for your business and the guests who are using um, the property. And so finally, I'm going to touch on what happens if someone develops COVID-19 symptoms when they're in your self-catering accommodation. Well, the important thing, um, and back to communication, is to give guests clear um, guidance of what you would expect them and what they need to do if that happens. Um, so they should book a test straight away through NHS and form, but they don't need to stay in your property and indeed they should return home if they can do that safely without public transport. The difficulty here is going to be if the accommodation is on an island because ferries are public transport and they can't be used safely. Um, but the implication from the NHS guidance seems to be that if you can't offer an extension to the stay, for whatever reason, the NHS will take steps um, to find alternative accommodation for your guests. And it's up to Taste and Protect to decide who else in their group um, needs to self-isolate if there's a positive test. Now, I hope that, is, which has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour, has given some useful practical pointers I think the key thing here is to be aware of the activities involved in your business and that includes what third parties are doing for you and thereafter you need to communicate whatever it is you're doing with your staff, with your customers and potentially with the community around your business. Half the battle here is going to be persuading people that you are taking proper care. Thank you, Kate, and uh, thank you also, Grant and Riddle. A lot of uh, a lot of information and in all of that, and and a lot to to think about. We've got about ten minutes left, and there's a, a few questions um, which perhaps our, our speakers can answer. Um, the first question, I think, I think this one's probably is for you, Grant. Um, you said that if you you can't perform services, then a refund must be offered. So if somebody had booked accommodation or indeed booked fishing or shooting or whatever, and had paid a deposit and then found themselves in an area of the country where they were under a local lockdown and were not permitted to travel, but you were still in a position to, to host them, would you have to return that deposit? I think ultimately the argument that the consumer will have is that the contract is frustrated because they cannot travel to actually receive the services. So I think the, the, the issue that you have then is it's not just that you can perform, but the, the consumer is actually legally unable to receive the benefit of the services that they've booked. So the argument then will be that the contract is, is frustrated. Uh, and then you're into what would the consequences of that be, and that may be that may be a refund. What I did say also though was that the CMA guidance does recognise that it may be possible for the business to say, well, actually, look, as a result of what uh, the booking that I the, the booking I have received, I have gone to expense in order to be able to provide those services. I understand you can no longer receive them, but actually, I have incurred the following costs and. On, on the basis that I expected that I would be providing those services to you. And I think it may be possible provided the terms and conditions allow it and provided it is very, very clear as to what the, the charge is, that it may be possible that the, the, the policy be to do. You're breaking up a bit, Grant, there. I don't know. Right. Sorry, so what I was saying was that I think that you have in cost, then I think provide your terms and conditions and they explain what the, those that are maybe possible to do before you return the deposit, if the terms and conditions provide for that. Okay. Um, uh, question, I think I think this is for, this one's for Riddle. Um, and it's really, I think it's sort of two, two-fold question, really. Um, Riddle, you, you mentioned that Visit Scotland were um, a, seeking to embark on a, a major marketing campaign, but that had been 
perhaps delayed or slightly put on, on hold? Was it at the request of the Scottish Government? Was it because you don't perhaps want to attract tourists? And, and the question is, what's your experience of the sort of balance, if you like, between, you know, in, in rural areas, businesses wanting to get back up and running and in some cases, local resistance to that? And secondly, what, what's your view on whether and to what extent staycationers, as the term seems to be, um, can and will fill the void of foreign tourists? Yeah, two really good questions. I mean, from the word go, uh, we were <clears throat> just before the main opening up of um, tourism economy, we were very aware of a number of communities, notably the island communities where there had been low infection rates, uh, where concerned um, that they might be um, involved in an influx of not only visitors but people with infection that, that would then spread throughout the islands. We spent a lot of time through my regional teams engaging with local communities trying to reassure them. I think one of the, the big things that happened to our favour was the good to go scheme that I referred to because that gave the reassurance that businesses in certain areas were picking up the guidelines that, that, that Kate was mentioning earlier on, and we're doing all the risk assessments and everything. So that gave communities reassurance that um, people were treating this seriously. There were a few isolated instances where people were genuinely not wanting visitors, but I think they were in the, the minority. But you're right, it was it was predominantly the rural parts where that was an impact. But we, we worked really closely with local communities, local authorities and others to try and um, mitigate against any kind of negativity there. On the staycation side, what we found is that um, certainly in terms of numbers, there's been a significant increase in, in the number of Scots, many of them for the first time ever holidaying in Scotland. Um, whether that's brought back the revenue that you would expect from international visitors is another story, and we'll not know that until the back end of this year, beginning of next. Um, as you know, um, international visitors spend twice as much as, as domestic, and so the loss of an international visitation has been a, a double whammy in this sense. Um, so certainly our experience has been so far that um, up to the end of the school holidays, uh, the numbers of Scottish and English visitors um, has, has been significant and it has brought much needed business to every part of Scotland, but particularly the rural parts. Thank you. Um, Another, another question, Riddle, for, for you, asking if you could um, perhaps expand a bit on what Visit Scotland is doing with Go Rural and its role, and is all agritourism being promoted or has it got a specific sort of commercial focus? Yeah, um, again, I, I'm happy to uh, maybe on the back of the, the call today share um, two or three specific slides that we've got. We've been We've had a member of staff seconded uh, into the uh, Go Rural Agritourism uh, team there, um, and we've been, we've been doing a lot. We did a, a search engine optimization of the, the website. Uh, we've been doing a lot of social media coverage for them. We've been uh, encouraging press and PR activity. Um, and at the end of the day, um, the criteria as to who um, agritourism applies to and the Go Rural piece has been pretty much left to the, the sector itself, as I said earlier on, uh, led by Carolyn Miller, um, who's got not just um, UK experience, but massive international experience um, across, the, across the world, actually. Um, she's learned a lot from being in Italy and North America and Australia and New Zealand. Um, so there's a, there's a, a clear um, um, opportunity to focus on and define more clearly, because I think one of the problems with agritourism, where does it start and where does it finish? And the focus has been very much on quality and um, weeding out those businesses that say they are uh, on working farms and are, are offering an agritourism and those that are not. So um, work on going there and we've been working with them. And the big piece of work right now uh, is around trying to help them get better figures for the value and volume of agritourism in Scotland. Um, because to argue any a case with government, you need to be able to prove that it's important. And while we can say 800 to 1,000 businesses, so what? 
how many of those are generating revenue and what does that mean to the Scottish economy. So wide range, but predominantly on the marketing side is our, our main input. Thank you, thank you, Riddle. Um, this is a question just come in to, to all of the panel, perhaps start with uh, probably Kate. Um, are you aware of any prosecutions or threats of prosecution or any claims by guests or, or I suppose participants in activities arising from the COVID regulations or issues, COVID issues? No, not at the moment. Um, that's not to say it won't happen in the future, but I'm not aware of it at the moment. And in terms of claims, at the moment, what we're seeing really is more healthcare settings rather than holiday settings. But I think as the activity increases and as we get further away from it starting, it's, it's more likely to become apparent. Thank you. Grant, have you come across, come across well, the only, yeah, I mean, the only thing that I would say is, as I alluded to right at the start of my piece, that, you know, I, there was quite a lot of noise very, very early on in, in terms of, you know, consumers um, being very unhappy with, with certain holiday companies, um, positions on refunds and remedies. And I think there's quite a lot of learning done very, very quickly by the industry. So nobody wanted to be the ones whose, whose names were being up in the in the highlights. And I think things have bedded down since then. And again, in many cases, kind of market forces have taken, taken over. So people are actually now, rather than saying, you know, there has to be a COVID reason to get a refund in order to attract people to make bookings, they're saying we'll offer an equivalent refund policy. Now that's a commercial thing rather than a legal thing, but I think from that point on, you know, there have been less less likelihood of, of disputes involving consumers because I think more folk in the business have been offering the, the refund and understood the, the requirement to do that. Yeah. Well, yeah, certainly in relation to, you know, for instance, breaching of the guidelines or potential uh, not following the guidelines. Um, the approach that I've certainly seen in practice with local authorities and licensing and registration, health and safety people has been very much about advice and advisory, not um, taking the heavy hand early on. So, you know, maybe it is because of ignorance that they weren't quite sure of what the guidelines really were and providing the advice that Kate um, outlined really strongly. The sector organisations have been fantastic. ASSC was a really good example, but Association of Visitor Attractions, World Scotland, we've been dealing with them all, and they've been able to provide advice, not just to their members, but to uh, a wider audience as well. Um, I think I would agree with Grant early on, it was all around refunds and people being very unhappy, but that certainly has calmed down quite a lot. Yeah, I, I suspect actually that the, the current period that we're in is probably more difficult than it was um, on, on the basis that when we were sort of in full lockdown, you know, there was no exposure for businesses, a lot of them, and also people knew quite clearly what the rules were. Now, um, with the rules seemingly changing daily and for different geographic areas and indeed for different nations within the United Kingdom and businesses attempting to reopen, I think it's probably now that, that the challenges are being faced and we may see more of this, unfortunately, coming through. I think, yeah. Alex, contractually, that is absolutely right. I think when... When there was lockdown, total lockdown, and businesses couldn't operate, it was very, very clear what the contractual position was. I think um, the, the takeaway from what I've been saying is, I think you need to make sure that your contracts are sufficiently flexible to adapt with guidance as it, as it evolves, so that you're clear what, what, when you're obliged to provide a service and when you aren't. Uh, because I think we are in areas where there are increasing shades of grey and there will be local shades of grey and it will be it will be quite difficult. So I think contractually, it was actually, much, uh, the outcome wasn't great, but it was much clearer where you were when you were in a situation of total lockdown. Yeah. Okay, last question very quickly. It's, it's three o'clock and this one's to Grant. Um, if businesses are concerned that their existing TNCs might not comply, can they do anything about that for existing bookings? I think they need to look at their terms and conditions. As I said, um, if you have a variation clause in your terms and conditions, so a clause that allows you to vary your terms and conditions, then you may be able to leverage that to do something about your terms and conditions. Um, but if you do that, 
uh, I think you have to be very, very mindful of the CMA guidance. So I think, but I, it, the CMA guidance does say that, you know, you can use those rights, for example, where some important legal development may have arisen. And I would argue that, you know, evolving government guidance might well be something that is, is not unfair, provided you don't put the consumer in a worse off position than they were before the change. And I think that's the important bit. If you're going to try, if you're going to find if there is a basis on which you can change your terms and conditions because it's written in your contract, then I think ultimately you need to be thinking if I make those changes and they would put the consumer in a worse position than they would have been, then I need to offer them an effective remedy. Uh, if you've no right to change your contract because there's nothing in there that allows you to do so and you have contracted then I think ultimately you have a contract, you can't change it. There's nothing to stop you having a dialogue with the people that you book with. Uh, and if you've got very, if you've very good reason that you want to change something, then they may be amenable to do that. Uh, and you can do, there's no reason why you can't have that dialogue. But that would be outside of your contract. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I think that, that is just after three o'clock. So I think we should probably wrap that up there. Um, thank you very much to everyone who has attended this afternoon. I, I hope you enjoyed that and, and find it informative. Um, you will be receiving further information about our um, other events that we're putting on in this series and, and please do, do support those and, and come along and hopefully they'll be informative and helpful. Um, I'd like to, to thank our speakers this afternoon, Kate Donachy and Grant Campbell from Brodie's and in particular um, Riddle Graham from Visit Scotland for, for taking the time to join us today out of his, his busy schedule and uh, enlighten us with his, his insights into what's going on in the, in the rural tourism sector. Um, and just once again, thank you all for attending and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>